Hello, and welcome back to the Book, Business, and Brand Building Summit. I'm your host, Jesse Krieger, and here we are live on Sunday. Very special treat for you all today. A friend of mine, somebody, a colleague in the publishing space, somebody who is absolutely crushing it. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you the one and only Chandler Bolt, five-time best-selling author, founder of Self Publishing School. This guy's books on Amazon have over a thousand five-star reviews. That's just out of this world. If you've got books out there and you know, you know how much that's worth. So with no further ado, I'm excited to jump into this interview. And here we are. Welcome Chandler Bolt to the Book Business and Brand Building Summit. How you doing? What's up, man? Hey, thanks so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm, I'm especially excited to talk to anyone who's here on a Sunday. <laughs> because if you're here watching this live right now, if you're not, look, if you're watching the replay, I'm not going to judge you or anything. Um, but if you're watching this live right now, I, I'm excited because that means uh, I think you got what it takes. You're putting a little bit, a little bit of extra work. So love it. Absolutely. Yeah. We were just chatting before here on, uh, you know, just on <laughs> Lane popped up in the chat. Hey, Lane. And, uh, you know, your work ethic, man, is something that I've admired for a while. And, you know, I want to cover, I will have sort of a free form conversation on this um, summit, but I'd love for you to sort of share what you've been up to these last month or two. I know you just finished the self-publishing success summit. You've got a big launch happening right now, another book coming out, gunning for the New York Times bestseller list. And maybe you can just give everybody here on the summit an overview of what, what it's like to be Chandler Bolt for the last month or two. Uh, it's a little crazy. I'm, I'm, I was telling you, I'm worn out right now to be, to be honest, and I'm about to take a little break. Uh, not a break break, but like a, you know, like a re refresh recharge. I'm gonna take a couple days off. I'm about to move to San Francisco. I'm pretty excited about that. That's coming up in about a week and a half. Um, but really what we've been working on is scaling up self-publishing school. That's the main thing. Uh, and we finished up a book. It's called Published. It's gonna be coming out this fall. I'm pretty excited about that. That's my first ever crack of the New York Times um, bestseller list. And so I know that that's kind of a screwed up system and a screwed up uh, editorial process that's not really a representation of what the bestsellers actually are. Um, but all that said, I'm going to go for it <laughs> and see what happens. And really, I just want to learn and then be able to report back the learnings. And you and I were chatting about this kind of behind the scenes. Uh, and, and I thought it was funny because you're working on another campaign. And, and you were like, well, yeah, I'm working on it and getting to learn, but it's someone else's book. And in nice terms, basically, and I totally agree with this, by the way, but in nice terms, it was like, you're the Id idiot that's like throwing all your money on the table for this. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. So we'll see. It might fail. It might flop. I don't know. Uh, but I, th that's kind of what we're working on. And it's just been, this is book number six. I mean, I figure we've done five books so far. Um, just keep keep doing it. And, and then lastly, just kind of doing a little bit of speaking. So kind of getting into that arena a little bit. But you you know me, man, we're, we're always talking about scalability. And um, so I don't know how scalable that is, but I'm just kind of di dipping the toes in that arena. So. Well, I definitely want to talk about that in terms of scalability and your approach to business. Because something I've observed, you know, since we had our like mastermind uh, a little over a year ago is, you know, just rapid growth. Like, so you've got a whole team now, you're doing company retreats, you got like one epic launch after another, whether it's books or your clients or the self-publishing success summit. But I guess before we jump into that, I'm really curious, um, as the founder of self-publishing school, somebody who's really, in my opinion, the biggest voice out there for self-publishing, you know, what was that decision process that made you want to go for the New York Times bestseller, which of course, for anybody that's watching this and listening, you can't really do that from a self-publishing perspective. You have to at least yeah. partner with a publishing company that has some existing distribution and reach into those markets. Uh, I'd love for you to speak to that and yeah. you know what sort of your goals are with that in terms of your overall community and the learning experiences that you can share. That's a great question. You know, when I looked at this originally, I mean, our biggest objection that we get from people is a lot of times like, okay, well, you're a 23-year-old kid. Like, why should I listen to you when it comes to publishing a book? Uh, and then the second thing is probably like, oh, self-publishing, that's pretty, uh, there's a lot of stigma around self-publishing. And a lot of people say, well, that's not real publishing. Uh, and so I wanted to just take something that as no matter how screwed up it might be, like the New York Times bestseller list, uh, 
is I wanted to take something that people recognize and appreciate on a mainstream level and say, hey, I want to give a crack at that because that'll legitimize a lot, a lot of what we're doing with self-publishing school. So who knows? It might be a total flop. Uh, and then that'll be a big PR move. Um, we can talk about um, how we failed or how the New York Times kept us off the list, but who knows? And I just wanted to give it a go and in and, and an effort to more legitimize because we're, we keep growing and growing and growing and there's a certain point where it, it kind of occurred to me, someone, they said, um, she said, until I saw your article in Business Insider, like that's when I was like, oh, this is legit and I purchased self-publishing school. And I was like, like are you serious? Like of it was all the things that you've article. done, right? That's the yeah. one that finally made someone say, now I believe you're legit. That's kind of That's funny. it. But then, it, then I realized, right? It's, it's like the whole don't fight gravity, don't fight natural forces. I realized that for the majority of our customer base and for the majority of people who are interested in that, that is the gospel to them. It's the New York Times bestseller list. It's publishers. It's agents. It's Business Insider. It's entrepreneur.com. It's all of these mainstream resources. And so rather than try and fight that and be like, oh, well, you shouldn't think that. It's like, oh, well, you do think that. So let's let's work with that. Let's channel those existing streams. So that's kind of what went into my decision to go for the New York Times list. And then the last thing I'll say is, on this particular point, I guess, is, is a lot of people, I got advice from a lot of friends in the industry who are like, you don't publicly say that you're going for the New York Times bestseller list when you go for it, because then if you miss it, it's like a huge failure, even if it was a successful, like it could be our most successful book launch ever. Uh, and then because we set this bar of like New York Times bestseller, that is the judge of whether it was a success or not in the public's eyes. And I thought about that for a while. Uh, and I may still be thinking about it a little bit. I don't know. I have, I have my uh, doubts, but I'm one of those people, uh, much similar to you, Jesse, which is like public accountability is so huge. So when I say some, I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it, and I want to throw it out there so that this is it's like a fundamental thing that we teach in self-publishing school is public accountability. So it's like if I were to cower away and be like, oh, yeah, well, I'm not going to tell people, how can they best, how can they help me? Whereas if I say, hey, I'm going for the New York Times bestseller list, we need to sell at least 10,000 books so far. We've sold 4,000. We're three weeks out. Can you help? Like that's very specific. And then if we sell the books and for some reason the New York Times decides to keep us off the list, so be it, uh, and it wasn't in the cards. Well, that actually would make a really great story, and I could see how yeah. your community, your audience would follow that. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you on the public accountability and how that can help enlist support. And for everybody that's watching and listening, you know, if you have that loop in your head about you know, not putting yourself out there in a big way or thinking that you're going to work on your book in private and then all of a sudden unveil it to the world and everybody's just going to be standing there waiting for you to see it, please take a lesson from Chandler in putting yourself out there and setting big ambitious goals and actually following up and saying, hey, this worked or this didn't. It's not really about, well, okay, it is about if you get it or not because it's a huge accomplishment to get the New York Times bestseller list, but even going for it, even the process of doing it um, I mean, I, I imagine it'll be a huge learning experience and I'll be excited to trade notes around, uh, around Christmas time because yeah, I haven't announced this so publicly, but we're also working on uh, our first New York Times bestseller launch from a publishing perspective, right? Mm -hmm. But here we have, you know, you as the author also working on the publishing side, um, putting that together. So, you know, I think the thing I like about that though, Chandler, is you know, even though you're going with the somewhat traditional published route to, to aim for that bestseller list, it's still a book about how people can publish their own books, right? And yes. you could use this opportunity to share a little bit about that book, which, um, which you're going to be releasing later this year. Totally. And I saw this um, question from Bill said, uh, so this, is this book going to be self-published or will it go through one of the big houses? I'm confused, which is kind of um, exactly like you were just saying there, Jesse, which is so what we, I, I did a lot of research on this and obviously with a business called Self Publishing School, uh, I want to self-publish and that was the only thing that I wanted to do. And I basically did a lot of digging and digging and digging and from everything that I found, people just said, hey, look, you can't hit the list self-published. Like it's been, it's happened before, but it's like, you got to sell like 30 or 40,000 books and the next person sells like 10 or 12 or whatever, uh, 15, whatever it might be on that week. Uh, and so the, the, the odds aren't stacked in your favor. So what we decided to do is we found a hybrid publisher, which is more of an entrepreneurial publisher, um, which I know you know of, uh, Jesse, which is Morgan James. So 
Um, we decided to work with David and the guys at Morgan James. I'm pretty happy about it. Um, we got a, a pretty awesome deal with them, and it, it's going to be hybrid published. So basically, what that allows us to do uh, is to keep a lot of the rights for things like the ebook, the audiobook, stuff like that. Um, and then we're able to kind of have this hybrid publishing deal where they'll get distribution into bookstores. They'll and and really they'll they'll help get through the gatekeeper of like the editor that's like vetting the New York Times list and they're like ah recognize this name and and that's like a big gatekeeper for that. So that's why we chose to go hybrid. Uh, and I, I'm happy with that decision. I mean, obviously, I'd, I'd prefer to go self-publish if I could. Um, but we're going to rally behind this and just say that, hey, look, you don't need a big five publisher and you don't need a big, a big old traditional publishing house to do this sort of thing. Um, but to answer your question about talking a little bit more about the book, uh, so it's called Published. Uh, it's the proven path from blank page to published author. It's basically the 10,000 foot view of what we teach in self-publishing school. And it, it's, it's a reinvention of our book, Book Launch, which, which is our most successful book to date. Uh, it's got like 580 something reviews on Amazon and it's, it's been pretty successful. But I feel like at that phase in my life uh, that we were rushing into a launch and I feel like I rushed that book and I didn't give it the justice that it needed. Uh, and it was kind of the stage in my life where like the month or two after I published that, that book, because I had just threw all the chips on the table with self-publishing school, like the month after I published that, all my bank accounts were negative. Uh, and it was right before we made this huge, huge climb. But we kind of like, all my bank accounts are negative. And I think I'd borrowed 15 grand from friends and family. And I was just like, I'm pushing all the chips into the table and I really hope this works. And so I feel like with that sort of pressure of like, hey, I need to pay rent, like you're kind of just like, yeah, 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 the book's done, put it out. You know? and, and so now we've got some time and some resources that we can put behind this. I think we can do a much better job. And I think that we did a much better job with published. And so I'm just excited for it to be more of a mainstream book. It's, it's kind of like our calling card, like you'd see like a launch for Jeff Walker, dot com secrets for Russell Brunson, ask for Ryan Levesque. Like it's, it's going to be kind of our calling card. Um, for what we do at self-publishing school. So I'm pretty pumped about that. Yeah. And I mean, just thanks for being so vulnerable and open with saying how, you know, going into that book launch, you were like all in, I mean, leverage, bank accounts, negative borrowing money. And, you know, as a separate from being an author, as an entrepreneur, sometimes that's what it takes to really give yourself the best chances for success. If you're watching this and you have a vision, if you have a goal, a dream for your book, your business and your brand, you know, sometimes passion alone isn't enough. You need to get the resources together, set a high bar, and then really just work in every way possible to go after it. I think that's something that Chandler has modeled really well. And, you know, I want to just elaborate on something because I know people are asking about it. Today is self-publishing versus traditional publishing day. And as we mentioned, it's all kind of in the family here. You know, Morgan James Publishing is who published Lifestyle Entrepreneur. And, you know, David Hancock, his video uh, interview is also live today for everybody on the summit. I wanted to give the audience here this contrast of, you know, Chandler is sort of the biggest voice for self-publishing. Morgan James, whether or not you call them a traditional publisher, they definitely have the reach, they have the distribution. And somebody is asking, you know, what is a hybrid publishing? It's just a little bit, uh, if there's a spectrum, well, maybe you can speak to this too, but my perspective is, you know, self-publishing, it's 100%, you do it all yourself and keep all the proceeds. Traditional publishing is you give away a lot of the rights, a lot of the royalties to your book, and what you really get access to is the in-store distribution and the relationships that they have. But um, hybrid is you know, a, a company like Morgan James that has the distribution, has the reach for their books, but is also entrepreneurial and um, can really work with the authors and with their marketing team to hit goals like going for a New York Times bestseller launch. and. Um, is there anything else that you want to say on that process and, and how that's been going so far? Because I know a lot of people have questions about this. It's admittedly kind of a uh, arcane subject. It's difficult to really dig up what goes into launching a New York Times bestseller. And I know we're sort of learning on the job as well uh, in, our, in our, each of our own ways. Yeah, so I mean, I think you kind of nailed it when you said the hybrid thing. The only, only other thing I would add to that is the fact that when you do it, it's uh, 
it's not like full, it's not all the way on the other end of the spectrum as like a distribution deal, but it's a distribution plus some publishing services. And it's a little bit more like a la carte, kind of pay to play sort of, you come in and you get what you need and they help you and they're very entrepreneurial. Now, the one thing I will say is, it's like a picture of being an entrepreneur versus working for the government, <laughs> right? Two very different ends of the spectrum. Like when you're used to, okay, all right, and we'll, let's take that a little step further. Picture running an online business like you and I do, Jesse, and then all the way on the other end of the spectrum is like working with the government, okay? Or working for the government, okay? And nothing wrong with if you work for the government, but like I think everyone knows that it's just like very slow. There's a lot of monotony. There's not a ton of motivation. And even the motivation that does exist is squandered by like, all of the processes and just ridiculousness, right? Then you have all the other, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, which is someone like Jesse and I, which is like, hey, running a business from our laptop, we can travel all over the world, we can do whatever we want. If I have somewhere I wanna go next week, I'm gonna go. Uh, if it's a vacation, I'm gonna do it. Like, I'll do whatever I want, you'll do whatever you want. And so I, I kind of look at self-publishing versus traditional publishing the same way. It's like full freedom and autonomy. Now there's a lot of negatives and there's a lot of positives to be an entrepreneur like we are, but that's the fun of it, right? And I think as, it, as you move more and more and more, you'll, you'll realize that like, I used to always tell this to my guys uh, and student painters, I, an internship called Student Painters where they train you how to run a business by running a painting business, right? And I used to tell them we would be recruiting and I'd say, look, if you want to be an employee, there's this box. It's about this big. And you're never really going to go too high or too low with your emotions and your happiness on the job. But if you choose to come be an entrepreneur, the box suddenly gets a lot bigger. It's like going from a merry-go-round to a thriller coaster. And there's some high highs and there's some really low lows. And sometimes three of both of them all in one day, right? It's like top of the world, bottom of the ocean, top of the world, bottom of the ocean, up and down again. Uh, and, and so it's very easy to, the, the trade-off, people pay for the security, right? So they'll pay to be like, yeah, no, I just want you to handle this and I, won't have to I don't want to have to deal with it. So I think that applies to the whole self-publishing versus traditional publishing method is like, okay, you're, you're, you're giving up a lot of things for the security of a publisher. And the, and the only problem I have with that is it, it's becoming more and more of a losing proposition. It used to be, that publishers would market the book. It used to be that publishers could get you in bookstores, which was the holy grail. But now bookstores are closing. Barnes and Noble is going out of business. You know, Amazon's popping up physical bookstores. And guess what books they're selling? The ones that sell, not the ones that are published by publishers. They don't care if it was published by a publisher or not. So I think we're seeing this massive trend and this massive shift uh, in what's happening via Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and just the publishing industry as a whole. And it's actually, you're a music guy. It's very similar to the music business. Like record labels are getting kind of pushed out uh, and they're all consolidating and all those things because of things like Spotify. And now what's happening is they had one thing, like one chokehold, and that was distribution. And they still have that, that chokehold of distribution, which is radio, you know, the fat cat executives and record label, whatever people, and they still have that chokehold. And I think it's similar to publishing and it's continually shifting, continually shifting. So they had that chokehold on book, book distribution as a whole. And now what you're seeing is Amazon's kind of taking that, that one leg that they had to stand on and they're kicking it out from under them and saying, yeah, this, this isn't going to fly anymore. So I all those, no what's that? Sorry, go ahead, finish your thought. I was gonna say, so although it may make sense for 0.01% of people to go with a traditional publisher, I think it's starting to make less and less sense. Yeah, and you know, I, I like that analogy. I would even extend it further to say, you know, almost all content, almost all media, over the last 10, 12 years has been going through this massive revolution. I mean, we were chatting before we got started here. You know, my very first business was um, running a record label and I was playing guitar in a rock band so many analogies to having a publishing company and working with authors and actually just building the business structure to perpetuate the creative output. Um, and in that process, you know, have all of the highs and lows that Chandler mentioned, sometimes many of them in one day. Yes. But, um, but, you know, my, I witnessed firsthand, you know, this was 12 years ago or so, uh, living in Nashville with a record label, year over year, CD sales were falling 30% over year, 30%. Same thing with books, right? Barnes and Noble, Borders, they're all either closing stores or going out of business at the same time. 
Amazon, which um, some of the other presenters on the summit, like Dave Chesson, Steve Scott, really peeled back some of the layers on um, the algorithmic approach, right? When Amazon's opening a bookstore, they know what to stock because they know what sells. So it takes a lot of the guessing out of the game, which is what that bottleneck is, I think, um, with traditional publishing, same with other forms of media, that gateway is the people that, quote, knew the market and knew what books to stock, knew what music to release, when and where. That's quickly changing. And in, from my perspective, be interested to hear yours, rapidly dissolving. I mean, I, you know, talking to some people on the summit, like Joel Friedlander, who's been in self-publishing for 30 plus years, he's like, back when he self-published his book in the 80s, then it was stigmatized, right? Then you're like, literally printing books and binding them and and selling them and people are like what are you doing now i think it's become more in vogue it's become more um, popular and accepted but we're in an exciting time and i think you're perhaps almost best positioned to see how that frontier is shaping up what's your outlook for self-published authors for the self-publishing industry say over the next one to three years um, based on all the people that you work with, all the work that you do in that space now. Oh, yeah. I mean, this gets me excited. I could talk about this for hours. Ultimately, our vision with self-publishing school is to put the publishers out of business and to show people that self-publishing isn't just a option, it's the best option. Did you um, tell so Morgan James that when you were saying <laughs> the deal? <laughs> I, I actually did, but I said, I like you guys, uh, and, and you guys are the good kind of publishers, I think. Um, I, I'm kind of not a big fan of the big, big publishers and all that stuff. I actually like the approach that Morgan James takes. I um, just had they, to ask you, it's just a fun They certainly got a kick out of that though. Um, but that's our ultimate goal is to show people that, hey, self-publishing isn't the redheaded stepchild, right? It's, it's, it's not the thing that you do when you just can't get a publisher. Like it's the best option. And you see people like Hal Elrod, The Miracle Morning, Pat Flynn, Will It Fly? Uh, you see fiction authors that are starting to do bit like just self-published with huge, massive books. You see people like Tucker Max negotiating distribution deals uh, with uh, with publishers, which is basically just like, hey, slap your name on it, and 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 it's a distribution deal, right? And and so there's all kinds of things changing, and so I see it becoming better and better and better and better, especially with Amazon, because over seventy percent of all books are bought that are bought are bought through Amazon. Uh, so I see it just moving forward and forward in that line. Uh, and because when you go on Amazon, is there like a, a big old banner that's like published by a traditional publisher? No, it's like a small, small little byline that only nerds like you and I know how to find it in the, in the Amazon store. And like the average consumer's like, I don't know where that is. And who cares? I just want to know, does it have any reviews? And what are people saying about it? And does the cover look legit? Like that's all they really want to know. And, and so I think that makes it really, really exciting because there's this, there's this frontier, there's this opportunity that's never existed before with Amazon that there's so many fewer barriers to entry. So I'm really optimistic about the future of publishing. And I actually even had kind of an interesting conversation um, with Tucker Max a while back. And that, that guy's just so smart. I love him or hate him. He, he's a real smart guy. And, and we were, he brought up an interesting point. Uh, and he said that, you know, all of these publishing industry or all these publishing companies, they're small parts of uh, bigger like television stations. So like ABC will own a bunch of publishers uh, and all these things. And so it's under like this conglomerate media company, like 50 bajillion bylines down. And he said, you know, I think what's going to happen is some CEO is going to come in running ABC, CBS, whatever. And what's happening right now, there's a lot of cable cutters, people who are cutting their cable subscriptions, switching to Netflix, switching to Hulu, switching to streaming services, or just not having cable at all, right? And so what happens is that's putting a squeeze on cable companies. That's putting a squeeze on these networks. So he said, I think what's going to happen uh, is that it's going to move to where some CEO, they're facing massive losses. And what do they care about their job? not the long-term health of the company. Um, so what are they going to do is they're going to sell off the publishing because it's got a nice little recurring revenue stream, but it's like not bringing in much money compared to like TV or big blockbuster, other things that the company owns, sell it off. And then those will all get conglomerated, packed up into one. They'll have a lot less of a budget. Then that, that kind of 
is the future of the industry. And now they're just mostly relying on backlogs or the back catalogs that are the majority of the revenue. And so we're going to see a huge shift in the publishing uh, business. So I thought that was a super, super interesting uh, thought. And I could definitely see that happen, but I'm pretty optimistic about, uh, about the future for sure. Well, I'd, I'd be interested. To, I mean, I actually think that's a pretty fascinating perspective. I could definitely see that happening too. Right when you said that, the first thought that goes in my mind is, you know, two, three, five years out, if that's the case, I'll be in the buyer's market. You know, I'll pick up a couple mm -hmm. publishing companies and enter into the distribution channel we don't already have through just through an acquisition. Um, I want to address a quick point somebody's raising here. Bill saying, you know, he thinks that when a brave author, somebody with a big name, say for example, Stephen King jumps on self-publishing, that that will be the turning point, something that will kill the big houses. But look, you know, years ago, Tim Ferriss um, rocked the boat, two time at that point, New York mm -hmm. Times bestseller, through traditional publishing, all that good stuff. And then he, sell, he released his four hour chef book exclusively through Amazon. Mm -hmm. And that pissed mm -hmm. off a lot of people in the publishing space. Th this train has already left the station, you know, Bill and everybody yeah. else that's watching. This isn't something like in the future. This is a dynamic changing industry like right now. Um, what, what would you say about, you know, other bigger names bringing attention to self-publishing? Does it even really matter? Or is it more about the next generation of authors creating books, getting them out there and just building a groundswell of great content that is self-published? and I guess it's like you said, you know, if anybody's wondering, does it really matter to work with a traditional publisher? When's the last time you've gone on Amazon and done a search yeah. for a publishing company as opposed yes. to a book or an author? People yeah. in general aren't as concerned with the publishing companies. And I, I, I agree with that. And that's a great point, Bill. And uh, I think there has been the, t the toes dipped in the water. And I actually I absolutely think that it will help uh, when bigger names start to switch over. Uh, I think it'll help. Uh, I think right now what we're fighting is the the behind the scenes stigma or perception versus the public perception. So all authors know, hey, I'm basically going to get screwed when I go with a publisher. Uh, it's going to take me two years. They're going to take all the rights to my book and they're not going to market it. They're not going to do anything really um, besides print it and get distribution. So I think behind the scenes, we recognize that, but still the public persona, I think that is where it has to change. That's why I'm interested in doing something like hitting the New York Times bestseller list and then making fun of it. So basically telling people like, hey, this is, this is a joke. Like this is a rigged system. And yes, I did hit it, but here's how I did it. And th like, this is not how it should be. It should be based on, it should be like the USA Today list, which is truly based on volume of books sold, not like the New York Times bestseller list. And so I think it takes things like that and public attention and a lot of PR, which will happen whether we hit the list or not. This is gonna be a big PR move for us to like really reach out and shake people and be like, hey, this doesn't matter. Like publishers don't matter. Bookstores don't matter. And I think it really, it, I think it really is gonna take a change in public perception for that to happen. And then the next phase is just buying distribution in bookstores. You see that very similarly in airports where you can buy distribution uh, in airport. I forget the name of like the big, it's like Newport News or Hudson something. Yeah, yeah, Hudson News. Hudson News. Like you can buy that placement and you have to buy that placement like in, in bookstore like windows and all that stuff. So I think it's actually going to turn more towards that model, like pay to play. And that's where entrepreneurial entrepreneurs will thrive and it won't be an old school like you have to have a publisher and that's when I think it gets really interesting because if that's similar and now oh, all of a sudden I can buy distribution in Amazon physical stores uh, and I can do things like that and I can do that all myself I think that's where, where it's gonna get really interesting yeah and you know for anybody that's watching this you need to understand traditional publishing is a retail business model just like when you go into a supermarket and you see an end cap with all these featured products, that's mm -hmm. not just somebody in the supermarket's choice saying, hey, we should put them on the end of the aisle. That's a paid position. Mm -hmm. Very same mm -hmm. for books, right? If you have an end cap with the cover of your book facing out and multiple copies, that didn't just happen um, by chance. And certainly not in an airport, some of the most heavily trafficked retail <laughs> environments in the world. This stuff isn't left down to chance. It's very much a science. It's very much a business decision. And 
I think the exciting thing, um, just to carry on from what you were saying, Chandler, is you know if you're making a choice between buying distribution in, in a place or putting that money into marketing the book, that's what I think makes self-publishing and this hybrid publishing so exciting because you have an option to allocate your budget, your marketing spend to actually connecting with authors, getting that book into readers' hands as opposed to dealing with middlemen and hoping that they give you access to a place which will then ultimately result in retail purchasing behavior. Um, and I know you teach a lot about this. I mean, maybe we can dive into, um, you know, what advice do you have for the authors, the author entrepreneurs that are watching this that are pretty committed to going the self-publishing route, but maybe don't know exactly uh, the steps to take or the potential pitfalls to watch out for. I mean, now that you've worked with literally thousands of authors, what advice would you give to that author that was maybe you a few years ago? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I would say is you need, it's the old Stephen Covey, you, you need to begin with the end in mind. So where are you going? Why do you want to publish a book? And better yet, why do you want to self-publish a book? Like where is this book taking you? What is your end game? Is it to sell books? Is it to, to drive leads for your business? Is it a glorified business card? Is it a credibility play? Uh, is it like, what is it for you and what is it for your future? Uh, Cause I think so many people, they just don't know where they're going. So then they get there, which is someplace that they don't know, <laughs> right? Because they, ha they haven't taken the time to sit down and think like, where am I actually going? So I, I think that it's one of those things where if you begin with the end in mind and know where you're going, then you can actually make strategic decisions accordingly. So like if I know published, this is going to, teach people and change people's lives and a small percentage of them will buy self-publishing school, right? So if I know that, I know that, okay, if I buy this placement in a Hudson News place where there's affluent buyers who are flying, which means they're automatically in like the top 5% or whatever of the US population that can afford to and that flies consistently, uh, then I know, okay, X percentage of people might go into buy self-publishing school. Like I can make decisions, but it's only because I've I've thought out to like what this book means for me beyond just like, hey, I'd love to sell somebody a book. You know, it's like what 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 else is there? Um, because I think if you're just coming into to to just make a bajillion dollars off of book sales, sorry to bust the bubble, but like it, it, you're you're not going to be a Kindle millionaire. Uh, it, it's just the days of that are over. But you can use this this book as a tool um, to really go into that. So that would be my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is that your self-published book shouldn't look self-published, <laughs> okay? So yes, there's not a big byline on Amazon that says, hey, this is a publisher or this book was brought to you by a publisher, but people can pretty easily tell if they look at your cover and it looks like it was designed in Microsoft Paint. Like, they're gonna quickly realize that, yeah, this is self-published and I don't trust this. So you should spend some time, get a good cover. Focus on making the material good. Don't just slap a book out there and slap a pen name on it and all those things. Like so many people are doing it wrong. Like quality does matter and make sure that your self-published book doesn't look self-published. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's great advice. I always say that the world will judge your book by its cover. And it's true, you know, if the cover doesn't look up to par, nobody's ever gonna see what's behind it, the actual content that you spend so much time working on and writing. It's a, a huge business value of mine is, is design. And, um, and I think you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. I know you teach that in self-publishing school. It's so important. And yes. uh, it's the same reason I have all, all the books that we've published on my wall, I just like looking at them because they got good looking covers. Yeah, and if, you, and if you're not confident enough with the cover of your book to slap it on your wall like you do, and then to have it like in the background of video interviews, like if you're ashamed to do that, that's probably a sign that you haven't invest, invested enough time and money on a good cover. Because a good book, it, the, the cover and the title and everything, like it should jump out at you. Uh, and it should be quality and something that you're proud of. And I always say like a good book cover and title and subtitle, it should be, it's kind of like the old copywriting thing where it says it should slap your buyer out. It should reach out and slap your buyer on the butt. Like what happens when you get slapped on the butt? You're like, hey, like what, what was that? And that's exactly what should happen with a book cover and a title and a subtitle. It should slap your reader on the butt and say, hey, pay attention to me. And not only that, but my litmus test of whether a title, subtitle, and book cover is good enough is do I instantly get what the book's about within two seconds? 
If the answer is no, if you, if you have to tell me what the book's about and I don't get it just from your title and subtitle, then it's probably not a good title and subtitle. But if I get it just like that, then okay, cool. I'm not confused. And as the saying goes, confused people don't buy. Right. So if I'm confused, I'm not going to buy your book. So you have to make sure that it's super clear. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's such an important topic. Maybe you could speak to a little bit of what goes into creating a great book cover and especially the title and subtitle so that it does just reach out and give you a little tushy smack. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in terms of the title, uh, my biggest piece of advice would be to not go into title land. So people go into title and subtitle land and they start using words that they would never use ever. They start trying to rhyme. They start to start trying to make up acronyms. Like they're making up, like they're trying to be clever. Don't be clever. Don't be cute. Just be obvious. Okay. Don't be clever. Don't be cute. Just be obvious. You need to be very, very crystal clear what your book is about and, and don't try to do the whole rhyming thing. Just, Make it like you were, the best piece of advice I can give is go tell someone about your book and what it's about. So say me and you were sitting down, Jesse, and I'll say, look, I'm writing this book. It's all about helping people write, market, and publish their first book. Uh, it's taking what we teach at self-publishing school. It's a 10,000 foot view. It's blah, 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 blah. And I'm just gonna explain it to you like I would explain it to you. And then record that and then listen to the words that you use. Because oftentimes when I'm talking to some of our students, they'll tell me their title and their subtitle, and I'm like, eh just okay and then i'll say tell me more about the book because i don't get it and they'll start telling me about the book and they'll start using these descriptive words and i'll say okay what's the one benefit that your reader is going to get and they'll start telling me the benefits and i'm like that's it use that wording that wording and that wording there's your title there's your subtitle right and so i think that's so important don't get into title and, and subtitle land and and just speak it out um, because when you really start to use the words and how you actually explain it to people, that's going to help you get much, much more clear on what it is that you're trying to do. And I don't consider myself to be the most creative person ever. Um, so I get help from other people. Like for published, I didn't come up with that. I, I just said, I just told my team, I said, Hey guys, here's what the book's about. Like everyone, th I put up a Google form and said, everyone submit three name ideas. And then I went through and then we started voting on them and I was like, hmm, that's pretty good. And then we started doing that. I'm like, all right, now let's get the subtitle. So you can kind of crowdsource it if you'd like and then have people vote on it. And the last thing that I'll give is your, your, your title should be shorter and more clear. And then I always say your subtitle is your salesman. So that's where you go into the more keyword driven and the benefit driven thing. So it's like, it's almost like imagine if you're a boxer and the title is the jab and, and, and the subtitle is the right hook, right? And, and, and so the, the, the title just kind of lets them know what it's about and then you knock, it, you knock them out with the, with the subtitle. So for example, my recent book, Book Launch, the title of the book is Book Launch. Obviously that's keyword heavy, that's something that people search, things like that. So it's Book Launch, and you kind of get it. Uh, and then I think the subtitle is something like how to write, market, and publish your first book in three months or less and use it to and use your book to grow a six figure business or something like that. So really long, but it's very, very specific. So you want to be specific uh, and, and throw in benefits if you can talking about what the reader will get when they read the book. I love that. And you know, I think that you're a great example of that. I mean, when you look at the titles of your books, book launch, published, how to not suck at writing your first book, even without the subtitles, it's pretty darn clear what these books are about and what mm -hmm. um, and what the focus is, right? You don't get creativity points for using like a double entendre or some inside <laughs> yeah. joke that yeah. only a fraction of a percentage of the population is going to get when it comes to your title. And you know, you touched on something which I think is a great segue um, in terms of the naming. Besides just being a good descriptor and having that jab with the title and then really selling it with the subtitle, which I strongly agree with. Um, is the when you mentioned keyword heavy, right? People are searching for it. To what extent, to what degree do you teach others and you yourself really focus on what the market or what people are searching for, what people are actively looking for when it comes to picking a title, picking a subtitle and, and putting it out there? A good point. I, you know, it's kind of like there's two ends of the spectrum. There's one is like focus on what the market wants and then you write that book. And there's the other, which is like, just write what you want to write about and, and be very clear with that. 
Um, I think I would fall kind of on the latter side of the th- side of the thing. It's like I want to write what I'm passionate about and then position it in a way that it can sell. Uh, that that's kind of the the route that I take, which is a little bit uh, controversial and like probably I don't know not the best. Uh, but and again, so what a lot of people will tell you, but I, I just really believe in it. And I'm I feel like all marketing is just positioning. Um, so whatever's in the book. Uh, and, and I'll tell our students this is like, it almost doesn't matter what's in the book. Uh, and in terms of how that relates to your title, like it 100% matters what's in the book and that that's quality. But when you're titling your book, it's all about positioning and it's all about the hook. And I think too many people don't get that. It's like being a good marketer, like I can sell anything and it's all because I can position that hook in a way that's appropriate. Uh, and, and, the hook is just the front thing that gets them into the book. And, and some people will go with a really bad hook and, and when that's, that's the difference between success and failure. And you don't have to change anything in the book to change the hook. Uh, and so that's kind of a around the, around the block way of answering your question. But I, I feel that really focusing in on the positioning is, is super important so that you position in a way that sets yourself up for success. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I think there is a... Um... You know, ask everybody here, have you ever heard of a book called uh, What Your Mother Wouldn't Tell You and Your Father Didn't Know? Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. That was a book that didn't really sell very well until nothing was changed except the title. And then the new title was Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And all of a sudden, people got it. And so I think that really speaks to being clear and direct instead of elliptical and roundabout. What does it actually mean to say what your mother wouldn't tell you and your father didn't know? It actually tells you nothing. But men are from Mars, women are from Venus is something you can wrap your head around and be like, oh, men and women are different. And here's a book that describes what those differences are and how you can overlap and on and on. But that's just an example of saying without even changing the content of the book, changing that title, changing the positioning, all of a sudden opens up access to a much wider market, expands the reach. Um, so I think that's a really great point there. And, you know, a couple of people are chiming in, you know, Bill saying, you know, novels are his game, not the entrepreneurial route. Look, let me tell you, Bill, and everybody else here, whether you're writing nonfiction, whether you're writing how to, whether you're writing novels, children's books, all of these things still apply. And, you know, the positioning, the marketing angles, it's all equally valid. I mean, if you want to see um, an example of a, a novel writer who's absolutely crushing it, check out John Locke, L-O-C-K-E. He's a, a serial fiction writer, but he also wrote one great book on how to do um, books and so forth called How I Sold a Million Books in Five Months. How I Sold One Million Books in Five Months. That's a great book if you're in the fiction game. And spoiler alert, you know, he has a series and he's communicating with his readers. He's getting feedback on what plot twists and developments they want to see. And then he writes them and people love it and they buy every single thing that he's ever created. And um, so anyways, everything we're talking about here is not limited to nonfiction. It's not limited to how to or business topics. And (laughs) and he says, that's why I'm here. (laughs) So, you know, Chandler, what else do you think the next generation of authors, the people that are watching this, the people that are writing their books and they're looking out, you know, they can see pa- they can see the light at the end of the tunnel and they're like, I'm almost done or I'm, I can see where I'm going to be finished with my book. But they feel so overwhelmed about all those next steps because, you know, let's be honest, there's a lot more that goes into getting a book out and launched and on a bestseller list than just writing it and coming up with a good title. So beyond, you know, a good cover and a good title that hooks people and positions you well, what else do people need to know about self-publishing to really find success? in this day and age? That's a great question. I mean, even just taking one step back, um, back to the part about the whole book business and does it work in fiction and things like that. What's interesting, I think, about the whole self-publishing thing is that the writing methods are different, but the marketing principles are the same. Uh, I get so many questions about this. It's like, but what if I'm writing fiction? But what if I'm writing children's books? But what if I'm writing, uh, you know, insert the genre? It's like marketing principles are universal. Just like 
psychological principles are universal. Uh, and one of my favorite books of all time is called Influence by Robert Cialdini. Uh, and it's the psychology of persuasion. And it just goes to show that like the underlying, the underlying roots of all marketing is the same and it doesn't matter what you're selling. It's just how you sell it. And the way that you sell it is very, very similar. Uh, so I think that's an important thing not to get lost uh, in the weeds uh, on that. Now, other things I would say that you need to know about self-publishing uh, is that you're going to need some support from editors, from uh, book cover people, from things like that. Uh, and that that doesn't cost thousands of dollars, or at least it doesn't have to. Uh, there's so many people that are just shady people out there that look and, or they know that if this is your first book, so they're just going to charge you thousands and thousands of dollars. And I think this has been the most frustrating thing is why I'm waving the flag of self-publishing uh, so, so much <laughs> is, is, is that it just frustrates me to see like people who, I spoke at an event a few weeks back and I was speaking to these orthos and obviously people are like, oh, orthos, they've got a bunch of money, right? And so what do they do? They pitch them these ridiculous programs and ridiculous, not even programs, but like, hey, we'll package your book for you or whatever. And it's just the shadiest stuff. Uh, and I'm like, well, what did you get for that? They're like, well, it cost me $5,000. And they like gave me this book thing and like a cover and did, and I'm like, this is the worst. Uh, so the, that's one thing I would say is that uh, there, you, it's not gonna, it's not gonna cost you thousands of dollars um, to publish your book. And if you find the right people, it, you can do it very affordably. Uh, so just be on the lookout for that. Use sites like Upwork, like Ninety Nine Designs, uh, like Fiverr, uh, and, and sites like that. Um, now Fiverr, you're not gonna always get the best quality. Um, so you have to sift through stuff on that. I'm a bigger fan of probably Upwork. And, but it just depends what your budget is. I mean, if you need to bootstrap, you can bootstrap and you can do it the way you need to do it. Um, but just be wary of people who are trying to take advantage of you. Yeah, and uh, you know, Shandi is asking here, and I'll, I'll speak to my experience and I'd love to hear yours. So you know, is there a decent or an average price for a book cover design? Um, this person is heading into doing their first book cover and has no idea about prices. I'm happy to share, I'll grab a link, um, but we've done almost all of our book covers that you see here with a few exceptions through 99designs. And you know, we'll put up a contest, I'll put a prize of like $325 or so. And on that platform, you, know, you describe what the book is about and then people actually design and submit um, designs to you. So you're literally getting dozens and dozens of designs, you can feed back, you can help steer them in the right direction, ultimately land on a winner, then that person gets the prize, and we're talking about a few hundred dollars there. I mean, in a couple of cases, um, I've spent a thousand plus on a cover, but uh, some of you might be hard pressed to look at all the books we've done and say that one cost over a thousand and that one was 325. Um, do you have anything to add to that in terms of pricing on, on book cover design and getting quality work for yeah. self published authors that may or may not know? you know, the business side, the pricing, and don't want to get taken advantage of. Like, for sure, describing is endemic and it's horrible. I hate hearing and seeing that because it just stains the self-publishing space even more. For Somebody sure. spends thousands and thousands of dollars and doesn't get a quality product. For sure. Uh, I would say if you need to, try Fiverr. Uh, but if you're going to do it, <laughs> hire like 10 people. <laughs> Uh, for five bucks a piece, so you got 50, bu 50 bucks sunk in there, and you then, or just hire extra gigs to get someone to edit their, the, the book cover further, and you can do that pretty affordably. Um, there's other resources like uh, 99designs. Um, I've had mixed results with that. Uh, th there's, I mean, we, we use a girl named Ida Fias Finningson. Um, she's a Swedish designer. Um, she charged, I don't want to say four or 500 bucks, something for a cover, and it's just unbelievable. Um, so that's where we go through, although I've also found people like uh, the, Ar the Archangel guys, um, Matt Stone and those guys, I've seen good stuff come out of them. Uh, and then there's a couple other sites that I'm, you know, I'm drawing a blank on now, but th those, that's my feedback is shop around and, and take a look at it. It's just grabbing this link for everybody here. Um, I'll just put that into the chat. I believe that'll take you to our the Lifestyle Entrepreneurs Press uh, profile within 99designs, and you're welcome to look at all of the different cover designs that were submitted for the books that we've published and see the price that we paid for them. So talking about you know transparency here, 
if you guys navigate over there now or in the future, I'll try and link that up afterwards as well. You can just see how all this stuff works in practice. It can only sound uh, confusing and arcane if you're talking about it, not actually going through and looking at these platforms and, and utilizing them. But once you do it, you know, the fog clears and you start seeing your book come to life in terms of the design and branding, and it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. So, um, you know, as we, gosh, time flies when you're having fun, and I know you're in an incredibly busy stage of, uh, of your life and career right now, so we will wrap this up by the top of the hour, but you know, I'm really curious on, uh, on what else is next for you. What do we have to look forward to, both in self-publishing school and with your own work and some maybe exciting things happening with your clients uh, and partnerships? And you know what's what's next for the man kicking the self-publishing world in half? Ah, uh, you know, really, it's the the New York Times uh, book push this fall. That's the main thing. I think we're going to do our first live event next year, Q2 of next year. Um, so that should be exciting. But it's just more of the same. You know, it's funny. You always go to these entrepreneur things, and people are like, "Hey, what's new?" And you're like, uh. And I was talking about this with my buddy John Corcoran, and he was like, nothing's new. Uh, there's just, I'm still doing webinars and they're still crushing it. And so I'm just doing the same thing. Uh, and, and I kind of relate to that in the sense that like, there's not a lot new. We're just doing the same thing and again, and a little bit better. Uh, so it's really just what's next for us. Um, we're about to hire a marketing director. So I'm pretty excited about that. We're growing the team. Um, we're, we've got a company retreat coming up here pretty soon and just really growing the team and, and just learning. Like we're going to do our first Kickstarter this fall and then I'll report back how to do a Kickstarter for your book. We're going to do a New York times book push. Then I can report back, Hey, here's how we did that. Just like kind of being the crash test dummy, uh, that's going out there and trying things and then just seeing what works and then continuing to push the envelope, uh, to where it makes less and less sense to go with a traditional publisher. So that's kind of what we're, uh, that's what we're working on. That's what, what's coming up. I'm super pumped about to release published this fall. Uh, and, and beyond that, it's just a lot more of the same. Yeah. I think that's actually really good advice that people listening should take the heart. Like, and I tried to phrase it as like, what's next? Not like what's brand new that. Oh, for sure. Been, for sure. Yeah. You didn't ask that question. No. Yeah. But, but just to say that, um, it's good feedback from people that are really successful. You know, one of my mentors says uh, your business life should be boring and your, you know, your sex life should be exciting. Like, <laughs> you don't have to completely marry those two, uh, meaning, you know, if you find something that works, do it better, do it more, do it at a bigger level, a bigger scale. Uh, and I think that's really solid advice. Maybe a couple tactical questions here that are coming in. You know, um, somebody's asking, I used create space for self-publishing for my first book, but the royalty for each book sucks. Uh, I need another option for the next book. And mm -hmm. you know, do you have any thoughts on platforms for people to self-publish and a preference on which ones may be better or how to get the best royalty per book um, for the authors watching this now? That's a good question, Bill. Um, my hunch would be that either you didn't price your book high enough or that you, there's a few things. Maybe you didn't price your book high enough. Maybe you, uh, you did you did color printing in your book, or potentially you did an odd size book uh, that 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 costs more, uh, and it's probably one of those three things caused your profit margin to go down on the physical copies of the book. Now it's no secret that print on demand companies like CreateSpace they're a little bit more expensive, but I've found not by much, uh, and especially when you when you contrast the uh, being on the, the being on a, on the hook for like a thousand plus books uh, sitting in your basement or whatever, like the opportunity cost there uh, is is pretty significant. Um, so those would be my first things that I would take a look at is the pricing of your book, the size of your book, and whether or not you did uh, a, a picture version. And the last thing I would say on that is, for me at least, the hard copy books they're not a big money maker. Like I would I make way more, and this is just for me personal, it's different on the person and also different based on the genre. Uh, like cookbooks, a lot of people don't want to buy like a cookbook ebook and almost definitely not a cookbook audio book, right? <laughs> it's like, what would you do with that? Uh, but uh, for me personally, it goes Kindle sales, then audiobook sales, then hard copy books.
Uh, and any specific platforms that you prefer for those, like if, if somebody's evaluating CreateSpace versus another option? I've checked into a lot of the other ones. There's Lightning Source, there's, uh, gosh, Lightning Source, there's, oh man, I'm drawing a blank. I did a big research thing on a while back. A ton of them, to be, to yeah. be totally honest, right? It's yeah. like, you know, we, have, we do distribution through CreateSpace, through Lightning Source, through ACX, um, which is for audiobooks. Audio. Yep. and Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP for Kindle books, of course. But uh, between those, you've got the bases covered. Like, you know, our books are available wherever books are sold, and it's through those those limited number of platforms that, uh, that we just named there. Um, so anything else that you wanted to say on that, Chandler? Uh, not really, just, to, I mean, print on demand, I, I found nothing better than CreateSpace. Uh, in terms of both quality and ease of setup. So the other ones, although it might be cool and you might could get a slightly better deal, I haven't found anything better than CreateSpace. Dropping in the link here for... Um, so as we start to wrap up, I know you got a, uh, a freebie, uh, a giveaway, something for everybody here that's listening and will be watching on the replay. Do you want to describe a little bit about what that is and, uh, and what you've put together for our audience? And then we'll start to take it home. Oh, yeah. So just this is just some uh, video training that I've put together. Um, it it kind of walks through the basic writing process that I teach, um, the marketing process that I teach, uh, things like that. It busts a lot of myths, a lot of doubts, uh, things like that. So that's kind of... Uh, what I put together, if you want to check that out, because I realize we're only able to cover so much and we're only able to get so uh, so tactical uh, in this, um, then you might want to check that out. So uh, check out the, there's some video training and also under that video, so once you go there, put your email in uh, and then right under the, the video there is uh, my book, Book Launch. Uh, so you'll get that for free as well, which I always like to say that like, that's a legit book that sells on Amazon. <laughs> it has almost 600 reviews. It's not like a crappy ebook, which I know people just immediately uh, think of when they're like free book, but check it out. Legit book. And, uh, and I mean, you've got more reviews on that book than most traditionally published authors um, <laughs> by a multiple. So, you know, huge congratulations on that. I dropped that link in. I'll link that up under the replay video so that you guys can all get Chandler's gift and a free copy of his book, Book Launch. And sure, in an hour, you know, I wanted to get Chandler's perspective on self-publishing, the direction of the industry. We got into some of the tactical and the practical details of self-publishing, but it's a big topic. It's why Chandler runs self-publishing school, because, you know, there's a lot to cover when it comes to self-publishing. And, you know, I just want to take this opportunity really to thank you. Um, and I appreciate you on behalf of the audience for coming on and sharing vulnerably openly what you're working on what you're doing what's coming up next and you know i just i guess i admire your your voice in the industry and the work that you're doing and wish you huge success on your upcoming book launch and everything else that you've got going on and if you have any final uh parting words words of wisdom words of inspiration for the audience this would be a good time to share it and then we will close this down perfect yeah jesse thanks so much man i really think that uh you're one of the good guys, uh, and and I know that everyone watching this right now knows that, so I just appreciate you for having me on. F final piece of uh, advice or tip would be uh, stop thinking about it and start doing it. Um, just get started. Uh, get, get some public accountability. Uh, whatever whatever this step in your journey is, whether that's writing your first book, um, whether that's taking the steps necessary to sell more books, embrace the uncomfortable. Trust me. I told the story earlier about uh, all my bank accounts being negative. Uh, then borrowing 15 grand from friends and family, uh, then quickly paying that off and then proceeding to borrow 30 more thousand dollars from an SBA loan uh, and then quickly paying that off, right? It's, it's being uncomfortable and get used to being uncomfortable. And especially as you get into the marketing part of this whole process, you are going to be uncomfortable and you are going to fail. I failed a lot and I'm going to continue to fail. Uh, and, and the failure is what makes me a success, right? And I think anyone would say that uh, anyone who's successful would say that that's, that's the key to it. So don't be afraid to get out there, start doing it and start failing ASAP. So thank you guys for having me and, and so excited to be here. Thanks so much Chandler. And thank you everybody for joining us on this exciting interview on the book business and brand building summit. 
we're still going uh, for the next four days. So I'll see you back here tomorrow. One big final summit thank you to Chandler. I know everybody here is loving it. A lot of appreciation for what you're doing. And we'll see you on the next interview. Thanks and take care.